My Lords, it's a pleasure to follow the noble Viscount Hamworth uh, with his arguments on about the financial sector, although I would ask the question we or make the point that we of course cannot afford the cost of not having a livable planet. There are no jobs on a dead planet. Uh, I feel I have to begin by restating the Green Party's long term opposition to new nuclear power. But I am going to focus today on the particular elements of this bill in the short time available to me. And I'm particularly opposed to the point made by the noble Lord, Lord Teveson, about forcibly adding to the debt burden of energy users the same people who are already going to be made to pay for the government's cost of living rescue package. Now, I don't have time today to go into detail about all the excellent reasons why local campaigners are so vehemently opposed to a new nuclear plant in Suffolk, or to revisit the arguments about why new nuclear is a terrible idea. Top of the list is that it's way too slow to deal with our climate emergency, together with the demonstrable fact that it crowds out the investment and attention we need on renewables and energy conservation, a point that I'll come back to. And I'm not going to list the woes of EDF. It shares down almost half in the last three years. It's French reactors expected to produce 10 per cent less energy than forecast this year, and it's regulatory and safety problems. Instead, I'm going to focus on two short cautionary tales. One comes from South Carolina. The story starts in 2008 with the decision to build two new nuclear power plants commissioned uh, from Westinghouse Electric Company owned by Toshiba. I could go through a long and sorry tale, but I'm going to cut it short and get to the final cost, $9 billion, something consumers in South Carolina will be paying for over 20 years. And what they've got for that is a hole in the ground that's been filled back in again. Commenting on the project, the former US Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner, Gregory Jasko, said, it used to be that you didn't start charging for a plant unless it was done and operating whether it was a nuclear plant or a coal plant." End quote. And I think that's particularly relevant for our debate about this bill, because the uh, former commissioner is talking about a time before the costs and risk were socialised and the profits were privatised, those profits going very much to the financial sector, as the noble Viscount said. And I thought it was interesting the noble Lord the Minister, in his introduction, did indeed acknowledge that RAB shares risk. And a very interesting use of word this, he said it could deliver at lower overall cost. But I'll come secondly to a cautionary tale somewhat closer to home that a number of noble lords have already referred to. The filthy, incredibly dangerous UK former nuclear sites that the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority acknowledges it still doesn't even fully understand. The Public Accounts Committee estimates the cost of the clean-up at £132 billion, a sum that is rightly described as astronomical. Other noble lords have referred to the contract, the private contract to clean up the Magnox sites. Uh, in, in 2018, four years after it had been let, the government had to take it back. The cost of that alone was £140 million. Now, I think it's really interesting that we haven't worked out what to do with the waste. And we're charging the public something that we can have no idea of the final cost because we don't know how we're going to get rid of the waste, and that's part of the whole project. Now, back in 2012, I attended a fascinating meeting of the local group in Cumbria opposed to deep waste nuclear disposal, uh, chaired, as I recall, by the former Conservative head of the County Council. I say fascinating because it was perhaps the most politically diverse meeting I've ever been at ranging from representatives from the Allerdale and Copeland Green Party to people who were fervent advocates of new nuclear power, but all were opposed to a nuclear disposal facility in Cumbria. And of course, Cumbria, through its county council, said no. So the fact is, in the other place, the minister said, they're looking to accelerate dealing with this problem. Well, you can't accelerate something that's absolutely stationary. Not without an awful lot of force, anyway. So I'll come back to the point that I started with about nuclear crowding out other opportunities, other ways of dealing with our climate emergency and our poverty crisis. There's a sure bet for the future for people and planet, renewables and, as the noble Lord Lord Teveson said, energy efficiency. 
And I note that the Office of National Statistics has just reported that these green industries have essentially flatlined between 2012 and 2020, while the government has been focusing on this approach. It's utterly neglected doing the thing that's the proven absolute certain practices that will deliver jobs in every community up and down the land. So what we should have is a Green New Deal brackets financing bill, perhaps funded by those who could afford it, such as the private landlords that the Green Party proposed last autumn should face a one-off land value tax to help deal with our energy issues. That would be a bill fit for our climate and poverty emergencies. Instead, we have a bill trying to resurrect a failed, expensive, outdated industry, benefiting the few while we all pay the price.